Hello and welcome to the Tuesday, May 23rd, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Typically, phishing emails isn't something we really worry about too much, but they had an interesting one today targeting users of the Uber car sharing service. Now, these phishing emails weren't just done pretty well with respect to the layout and such, but also the phishing site itself used a TLS certificate, which is somewhat unusual, even though not really that difficult to accomplish. The phishing email itself arrived as a fake Uber email that claimed that you just uh, took a ride with Uber and these emails looked just like what the receipts you usually get at the end of your ride look like. Now, the one thing they changed is that they had a prominent link at the bottom of the email that would link to Uber disputes. Of course, uh, the idea here was that as soon as you see this obviously fake or fraudulent uh, email, you would click on Uber disputes to dispute that charge with Uber. This is where the fish kicked in. This domain was fake. It was not associated with Uber, even though it did have a valid TLS certificate. In this particular case, the attacker did use Cloudflare as a proxy in front of this particular website. Cloudflare, of course, does offer as a free service TLS certificates. In general, this isn't really worse than what most certificate authorities are doing. Let's say Let's Encrypt and the like that will give you a TLS certificate if you are able to prove ownership of the particular domain name. And of course, the attacker here did own uberdisputes.com. Another sort of interesting part here was that the site disappeared very quickly after we learned of it. So some of my investigation I had to perform after the site was already shut down. Well, a certificate transparency helped here because certificate transparency logs still held the certificate. So I could verify that it was indeed issued to Cloudflare and uh, also passive DNS logs are also always useful here if you're trying to figure out what the IP address was that this domain name resolved to at a particular time. And talking about TLS certificates, Let's Encrypt had a rather severe outage late last week. And like so often, the fact that they had an outage isn't really all that interesting. What's really sort of interesting here is the postmortem that Let's Encrypt uh, did publish. In this case, uh, the root cause was an update that Let's Encrypt made to its software. The goal of this update was to better deal with double slashes in URL. You may have noticed this sometimes if you take a host name and then append the path to form a URL. If both at the end of the host name and then at the beginning of the path you have a slash, you end up with a double slash. Now, as far as URLs are concerned, that of course doesn't really matter. But uh, if you do compare strengths, like you find them in certificates, that can cause issues. So Let's Encrypt did want to fix this, uh, but sadly didn't fix it right. The result of this was uh, that requests uh, to the Let's Encrypt OCSP servers failed. Now to deal with the large number of requests, uh, Let's Encrypt relies on a content delivery network in order uh, to cache uh, the responses. However, and that's very typical, error messages are not being cached. So in this case, the actual OCSP server did return an error message. The content delivery network did not cache it, which then resulted in an abnormal high number of requests hitting the actual less in, let's encrypt infrastructure, which in the end was blocked as a distributed denial of service attack. The quick fix, of course, here was a rollback of the code, but still it took a while for things to go back to normal again. Lesson learned, well, aside from the fact that you probably should test your code better, overall, the use of a CDN sometimes can have these uh, unintended consequences if the caching doesn't work uh, quite as expected. So probably treating this as a denial of service attack may have made things worse in this case.
And then we got uh, more vulnerabilities in image magic. And now uh, this particular image manipulation library had a uh, huge problems. I think it was about a year ago that led to arbitrary code execution. In this new case, it's really more an information leakage vulnerability. What's happening here is that if you process an image in image magic that does claim to have a certain size, but then doesn't provide all the data to actually fill that size, the remainder of the data is being filled with a random memory data, which typically happens to be image data that was processed with image magic before. So it is yet one of these other bleed vulnerabilities where we do have a memory that's not properly initialized being leaked to other users. In this particular case, it was demoed with Yahoo Mail. Yahoo Mail apparently did leak images that were sent to other users with Yahoo Mail. So whatever image, uh, image magic processed before a particular user looked at one of those corrupt images, that data of the prior image will be displayed instead. Now, given the way the exploit works, of course, it will display an image of the size that the exploit gave, but the image that's being displayed may have had a different size. So the images do look corrupt, but still very much recognizable what's going on. Yahoo, as a result, actually stopped using the image magic library. There is a patch available for it now. So if you're using this library, please patch. And well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.